Welcome to our final study of the Christian graces. We are looking at 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 11, focusing today on the final warnings of Peter that are contained within this context. So let's start by reading the passage, 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you practice these qualities you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ." While Peter is at the beginning of his second letter, the end of this section that we are studying ends with this warning. And we've made mention of warnings previously, but before we tie up this study, it's important that we take some time to consider being spiritually nearsighted. Now, I've talked about being nearsighted in this study before. I related it to my own physical nearsightedness and being unable to see very far at all without my glasses. Being spiritually nearsighted is very similar. It means I can't really see much spiritually at all since I would be blinded by what is immediately in front of me. That is, this physical life, its demands, and its limitations. Peter takes it a step farther. He says we can be so nearsighted that we not only are blinded to anything that's very far in front of us, but it can make us unable to see what's behind us too. He says that we can be so blind that we forget that we have been cleansed from those old sins. Now, if you've been following our daily Bible readings, then you've recently read the first six chapters of Romans with me. There, Paul makes some things very clear. He says, we're all on an even playing field. No matter your background, we all have the problem of sin. He says that we can't overcome sin on our own. We can't earn our salvation. We can't work our way out of the debt that we owe because of sin. And only Jesus is the answer, bringing the gift of God, which is eternal life. And we can only have access to this gift through a genuine, obedient faith. Only then are we counted as righteous by God. Now, with these things in mind, I think we see how important it would be to remember that we have been cleansed from our old sins when we have become obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ in faith. If we forget such an important aspect of our place before God, it's like a house of cards in a stiff wind. There's nothing to hold it all together, and it all just falls. So here we are with this warning from Peter that if we lack these qualities and consider that we are not growing in our faith, which is what we've been examining, then we become blinded to very important truths regarding our faith and our place in the eyes of our God and our Creator. And as I pointed out last week, this involves bearing fruit. If we're blind, then we are not bearing fruit, and we are barren or dead. Our faith does not survive without developing these Christian graces Faith has to be nurtured, it has to be fed, it has to be refreshed. Otherwise, it shrivels and dies. So let's think about causes of nearsightedness. There are more causes to this state of spiritual blindness than just lacking in these qualities. There's simply more to it. In other words, we need to go back farther to find an underlying cause of the condition. Now, we might go to a doctor and they would diagnose us as blind and state that we've gone blind because of the optical nerve not working properly. But the why is not answered in that diagnosis. What caused the eye or the nerve to stop working the way that it should? Spiritually speaking, we can diagnose a spiritual blindness, but we need to dig deeper to find a cause. It's not just that these qualities are missing, 
but for some reason an individual didn't desire to grow in their faith, adding those virtues. Paul mentions a reason in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And he says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, did you catch that? The God of this world has blinded them. It is, is it really only a, an unbeliever that has never come to Christ that could be blinded by Satan? No. He's at work as our adversary to blind us from truth any way that he can. John gives us details on how Satan accomplishes that. He said in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You see, Satan uses our own desires and our own senses against us. He distorts our spiritual vision with these temptations and desires. John gives the answer to that distortion in chapter 5. He says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So we need faith to overcome, but what if our faith has been neglected? Well, it becomes weak. Paul called faith our shield amongst the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. And if faith is our shield, but our faith is weak... What do we end up with? A very poor shield. Can you imagine going to war in the first century? You go to the quartermaster and he gives you all the armor and the weapons, but amongst that he gives you this tiny little shield. It won't block anything. You look around, you see everybody else has got a nice big shield that they can crouch down and hide behind when the arrows start coming, and you wonder, how am I going to defend myself with this tiny little shield? That is, in essence, what we do when we neglect our faith. It becomes that very poor shield. The Hebrew writer uses an example to illustrate the failure of obtaining the grace of God. In Hebrews 12, verse 15 through 17, he says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Well, let's go back to the original account in Genesis chapter 25, beginning in verse 29. Here it says that once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, I have to say, that was a pretty expensive meal. He gave up his birthright for a single meal of stew. Understand that a birthright was very important to that ancient culture. The oldest one in the family, the oldest male, received that double portion of the inheritance. There was more here than just earthly goods, though. The promise that God had made to Abraham is part of this story, too. Instead of being included then in the lineage of Christ, the descendants of Esau became the nation of Edom, the enemies of God's people. What made Esau so foolishly pay for one simple meal of stew with his birthright? Well, it was, as John described it, 
the desires or lust of the flesh. His hunger and satisfying the appetite was all that was on his mind when he saw the stew. He couldn't see past it. He became nearsighted. Now, do you see why and how our desires are the cause of spiritual blindness? Esau gave up something incredibly valuable simply because he couldn't think about anything but his hunger. We also have a birthright as God's children. We have a great inheritance that is set aside for us. That's why the Hebrew writer used Esau as an example. Well, let's look at another example to enlighten us. I think we're all familiar with the sin of David with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11, beginning in verse 2. It says, It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Well, what blinded David? Well, due to a lack of self-control, David's accidental glance, seeing the nakedness of a woman while she was bathing, he began to lust after her. When he inquired about her and was told that she was married, his lust was still blinding him. He called for her and committed adultery with her. When she became pregnant, David tried to cover it up instead of confessing his sin. He went so far as to even have her husband killed. Through the lust of the eyes, David was blinded, and he never seemed to even realize the depth of his sin until Nathan the prophet came to him and used a story to point out his sins. Because of his blindness, David didn't see the consequences of the actions that he was taking. He only saw the immediate gratification of the moment, as well as the deeds to cover up his indiscretion. Shouldn't David have known that he was sinning? Of course he should. This is the danger of being blinded. You even do what you know to be wrong if you sat down and thought about it, looking past the immediate moment. And we can all fall into the same trap as David, succumbing to the lust of the eyes. We can't always control what we see, but we can control what we stare or gaze at. When I speak of the lust of the eyes, I typically use Job as an example. Job decided well ahead of time what he would and wouldn't do with his eyes, and he said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? When he says gaze, he uses a word in the original language meaning to understand. That would be to look in a way so as to understand her form. That's not an accidental glaze but it's a lingering stare. Our sight can be so easily used against our spiritual desires. A gaze ignites a desire for sinful activity that wasn't there before. Like David, that desire can lead one into sin without considering what we know to be the final consequences. One final example of being blinded is Rehoboam. Let's read this particular passage from 1 Kings chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Rehoboam sent to she- well, went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon, then Jeroboam returned from Egypt. And they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke upon us, and we will serve you. He said to them, Go away for three days and then come again to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon his father while he was yet alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? And he said to him, They said to him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, What do you advise that we answer this people who have said to me, Lighten the yoke that your father put on us? 
The young people, the young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus shall you speak to this people who said to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king said, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people harshly, and forsaking the counsel that the old men had given him, he spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. You see, Solomon had taxed the people heavily in order to pay for the temple, as well as other projects in the kingdom. The people made a simple request. Give us some relief. The work has been done. Rehoboam sought out advice, and that's not a bad decision, provided you consider the source of the advice. He consulted two groups. One were some older men who had served under his father. They advised him to show some humility and grant relief that was requested. They also told him that if he did this, the people would appreciate it and they would submit to his rule. The other group were some younger people, his friends. They advised him to assert his authority and increase the burden. He followed that poor advice and he lost ten tribes of the kingdom. Now what blinded Rehoboam? Well, it was the pride of life. His blindness caused him to overlook the sound advice of the older group of men. He couldn't see the benefit that they pointed out, a lifetime of loyal citizens. His pride caused him to desire to turn from the option of humility and go the route of oppressive rule. He suffered great loss as a result of that blindness. Pride is very dangerous. If only he had heeded wisdom such as pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, Proverbs 16, verse 18. We are taught as Christians to let go of pride and embrace humility. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. There are a lot of sins that can be tied to pride. For example, the prideful person, when they are offended, lashes out in anger. And Satan uses that anger to get us to act in very sinful ways. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Did you catch that? No opportunity. Don't let anger be an opportunity to the devil, nor should we let pride be that opportunity. But pride causes us to put ourselves above others and even above God. Pride leads us to refuse to yield our will in favor of God's will. What we really need to do is embrace a good example, and that would be Jesus. Jesus was tempted in all of these ways, and still he did not sin. This means that we can look to him, and he will show us the way to overcome our adversary. When Jesus faced the desires of the flesh, he trusted God to satisfy his true needs, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. When he faced the desires of the eyes, again he refused the temptation, saying, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Finally, when Jesus faced the pride of life, he embraced humility, saying, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. But did you notice Jesus' answer in all of these particular instances when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness? He always answered with the word of God. In other words, we need to feed our faith with the word of God. We need to know the word of God so that we can defend ourselves with that faith. Well, it didn't just stop there. Later on, 
in chapter 20 of the book of Matthew, Jesus went on in teaching humility. And it says, But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Even Jesus, the Son of God, deity dwelling bodily on this earth, embraced service, humility, and the Father's will. The fact is, Satan will throw everything that he can in your way. And if you have not built up your shield of faith, adding these Christian virtues, then you won't be able to see through his devices. You will be blinded to the far-reaching consequences of sin. You need to remember that as a Christian, you have been cleansed and that you want to remain clean in the sight of God. Embrace your faith. Realize how precious it really is and then get to work diligently so that you will grow that faith. Only then can you have the spiritual insight that God would like for us to have. Then we can have spiritual motivations and aspirations that lead us to bear fruit in the service of our Lord and Savior, seeking His will in all things. Thank you for joining with me on this study. I trust that you have benefited from it as much as I have. Next week, we will consider some additional subjects and start a new study, so please join me again at that time, and I would ask you to continue in prayer that God will be with us all.